so good morning all welcome you to this rescheduled session of the online classes of ma part 2 third semester english for the syllabus prescribed by rashtra sant tukroji maharaj nagpur university nagpur and being organized jointly by jm patel college of arts commerce and science bhandara rajkumar keval ramani kanya mahavidyalay jari patka nagpur and vasantrao naik government institute of arts and social sciences nagpur the topic for the session are the prescribed poems of matthew arnold and Ro and rosetti and uh, the resource person is dr govind uh, sorry uh, mr govind rathod is still uh, doing his uh, doctoral research uh, sir has uh, completed his masters from pune university and uh, he has got through his net as well as set both the exams and uh, his area of interest is modern lit uh, are modern literary theories uh, comparative literature and translation studies uh, sir has prior joining uh, this government institute sir has worked in the reputed colleges like uh, uh, he was he worked at the symbiosis college of Art, arts and commerce pune and dhote bandhu science college gondia along with that he has also he also has an experience of being a counselor for ma and ba program at ignu indira gandhi open uh, indira gandhi national open university uh, is pune pune chapter he was there then uh, uh, sir has presented uh, around more than 5 papers in his short career uh, equal numbers number of papers have been published and uh, uh, he has also um, uh, attended uh, gatherings as a resource person uh, around 7 to 8 assemblies he has delivered lecture as a resource person uh, he has undertaken various administrative responsibilities but what is uh, uh, extraordinary about uh, him here is that uh, his paper operation operation fr from within the narrative imperialism has was footnoted by Uh, no one less than uh, uh, professor gayatri spivak professor columbia university new york hmm, in her book readings uh, which has been published by seagull publications in 2016 so uh, with this introduction uh, i welcome uh, uh, govind rathod to to this uh, session and hand over the mic to him for the presentation over to you govind sir yeah thank you thank you so much kapil sir for that beautiful introduction uh, very good morning uh, to all the dg participants and uh, i take this take this opportunity to connect uh, with you on this occasion as uh, we are going through very trying times and turbulent time these days uh, it's very uh, important uh, to stay connected and uh, i take this opportunity to connect with you uh, on this digital platform in today's uh, lecture i'll be uh, discussing these two poems uh, which is prescribed uh, in the paper called romantic and victorian poetry uh, the poems uh, like the scholar gypsy by matthew arnold and uh, the blessed damsel by dizzy rogers so i'll start with uh, the scholar gypsy by matthew arnold first Yeah. As uh, we all know that Matthew Arnold was a Victorian literature of genius uh, who touched upon uh, various genres uh, in his uh, actually uh, literary outcome. Among the major Victorian writers, uh, we know that Matthew Arnold is is very very unique in it in a sense that it's uh, his reputation you know chiefly rests upon. his poetry and his uh, poetry criticism only a quarter of his productive life was given to writing poetry 
but many of uh, the same values, attitudes, and feelings that are expressed in his poems achieve a fuller or more balanced uh, formulation in his prose. This unity was obscured for uh, most earlier readers by user evaluation of his poetry as gnomic or thought-laden or as melancholic or elegic, and of his prose as urban, didactic, and often satirically witty in its uh, self-imposed task of enlightening the social consciousness of England. This particular poem uh, is a fine predicament of uh, so-called uh, the invisible bullets of the time. The poem essentially captures the spirit of the time, the zedicate of the time of Victorian era, in which uh, how uh, there was a, lock, a lack of uh, something called uh, you know, disciplined way of life, lack of value, loss of, you know, kind of uh, values in the society and how so-called uh, the Victorian souls uh, were diseased with this uh, disease of modernity, so to say. And therefore this poem, the scholar gypsy itself, you know, represents, the title itself shows that uh, the scholar gypsy represents the every man of the Victorian era. And therefore, uh, this poem is based on uh, uh, a story which was found in the Vanity of Dogmatizing, written by Joseph Glanville. The, uh, the poem tells the story of a poor and disillusioned Oxford student who leaves the university to join a group of traveling gypsies, uh, those were Romanist people. The scholar gypsy uh, wants not only to withdraw from his studies, but also to withdraw from the modern world. Is so welcomed and become such a part of the gypsy family that they reveal some of their secrets to him. When he is discovered by two of his former Oxford peers, he tells them that how, how the Romani have their own unique way of learning and living. He plans to stay with them to learn as much as he can, and he will then uh, wish you know he will then share their wisdom with the world. Although he does not wish to return to the world. Uh, himself. So Matthew Arnold's, uh, this particular poem, you know, anticipates the crisis of modernist period. The poem, as I told you already, is a fine testament of Arnold's preoccupation as a poet and as a cultural critic. The strange reasons of modern life. If you look at the gamut or hour of uh, Matthew Arnold, you will see that this is a kind of a credo of his writing. This is a watchword of his writing that he uh, explores this credo called the strange issues of modern life in his writing, in his prose, as well as in his poetry, in his poems. Arnold returns to this theme throughout his work, including in his poetic masterpieces like Therese's Dower Beach and in his major work of prose criticism called Culture and Anarchy. The scholar Gypsy serves as a template for Arnold's poetic and intellectual career and epitomizes his paradoxical combination of Victorian vigor and social uh, progressivism with a post sense of dissociation arising from the religious doubt and social fragmentation and envy. The poem, uh, is often called as a pastoral poem. It has often been compared with the pastoral elegies of John Milton uh, with the title called Lucidas, and other poem. Because the setting of the poem is pretty much pastoral uh, in the midst of nature. And uh, there is, you know, kind of uh, the beginning and the landscape that comes in the beginning of the poem gives us, you know, enough kind of uh, evidence uh, to explore this poem as a pastoral poem. And uh, the poem opens with a pastoral setting as uh, you know, it starts and I quote, go for thy call you shepherd from the hill, go shepherd and untie thy battle cords. No longer leave the wistful flock unpaid, nor they, thy bowling fellows rock their throats. Nor the cropped herbage shoot another head, but when the fields are still and the tired mane and the dogs all gone to rest and only the white strip are sometimes seen, cross and recross the strips of moon blanched green, come safer, and again begin the quest. So here, uh, the speaker of, of this college is described a remarkable rural setting in the pictures with the city of the Oxford very far. 
He sees the shepherd and the work in the field, reaping the harvest, and then tells the shepherd that he will stay there until Sunday, enjoy the view, and study the towers of Oxford. All the while, he would keep his book by his side. So the book that he has by his side is this very famous uh, book by Joseph Glanville. And his books tell the story of uh, Joseph Glanville, a poor Oxford student who dropped out of school in a group of gypsies. Once he was immersed in their community, he learned the secrets of their business and their life. His mates had hours to rule as they decide the working of man's brain. And uh, they can bind them to what thought they will. And I, I, he said, the secret of their art, when fully learned, will to the world impart, but it needs heaven seen movements for the skill. And therefore, uh, the pandit or the gypsy of, 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 the, of the poem or the protagonist of the poem, the most dominant person of this particular work of art, gypsy, you know, uh, admits to his friends at Oxford that he will go uh, in the company of, uh, the gyp of the gypsies and he will learn uh, the wisdom and the art of living life from uh, these people. Because as, as a modern, as, as a Victorian person, you know, like uh, this uh, representative Victorian person, the gypsy, uh, uh, gypsy's heart, unlike most of uh, uh, the Victorian people of his time, was not actually got infected by so-called materialistic development, materialistic upliftment of the society. Rather, he wants to find a solace in, in the lap of the nature, in the midst of nature, away from the halabalu of the city life, away from uh, so-called the materialistic ways of life. But having said that, you know, we know that uh, his, his, his disappearance from the scene, or let's say from the materialistic uh, life, and when he finds solace in the company of these uh, gypsies, he, he, he wishes to kind of uh, get this transcendence and wisdom from these people. And like all of us, you know, the scholar gypsy of the poem, it's for the heaven sent moment for his king. This heaven sent moment uh, basically refers for the transcendence of the soul, wherein, you know, there is a kind of the soul, wherein the soul transposes to the spiritual, you know, upliftment and enlightenment uh, through the rigorous, actually, you know, emotional and intellectual exercises. In this case, you know, like uh, when he disappears and he appears again on this, you know, on the scenes in, in the context of the poem. So, although, you know, as this, as this poem, you know, like uh, it's about uh, wish of the scholar, a gypsy to uh, remain aloof, from the materialistic uh, upbringing of modern society, society, but he is not fully actually capable of doing that because you know he reappears on the on the scene in the on the screen and on the scene in the poem again and again uh, at various uh, in, at uh, you know regular intervals, and therefore that gives us enough you know kind of insight into the psyche of the uh, peoples, you know people that how you know although. The, the person like the scholar Gypsy wishes to remain aloof from so-called uh, uh, this infected modern life, but he was unable to do so. And therefore he again and again reappears on, on, the, on the scene in the poem. And therefore, uh, when he escapes from the scene, you know, it, sees, it seems that he, he, he you know, who, who, who wants to go away from the society, uh, from the society that he was living in. But ultimately, you know, this is this escape, escapism of uh, the poetic persona or the character here is, uh, is a short, you know, kind of living because uh, he, although wishes to achieve so something called transcendence, the enlightenment of his soul, but he reappears uh, on the scene in the poem and again and again. So this, this poem, you know, captures the dilemma of, uh, of uh, the protagonist of the poem. And this dilemma, as we know, that uh, one of the features of the Victorian era was uh, the problem, you know, that most of the Victorian uh, people faced this ideological dilemma, uh, a various ideological di dilemma of science and religion, you know, mater materialistic life, or let's say spiritual life, right? 
or let's say you know how the world started you know the theory of evolution or the theory of revolution right and this ideological you know kind of uh, conflict of the two era uh, we uh, know that uh, conflict with this very famous name called the different dilemma and therefore this again refers another this poem again refers to another dilemma uh, of Victorian people and that the dilemma was whether to be the part of a materialistic society or to be the part of something called spiritual enlightenment. Because Matthew Arnold was of the view that uh, this materialistic development, you know, what he calls them as machinery in his very famous work called Culture and Anarchy. And uh, for him, the culture is a study of perfection. You know, if you could go through his very beautiful book called Culture and Anarchy, you understand how there is a culture and there is anarchy and what leads to anarchy and what leads to a culture. When I say culture, you know, I, I, I mean, mean to say by, you know, giving the reference of Matthew Arnold that he, you know, actually has explored in this beautiful work called Culture Anarchy that culture, according to him, is a study of perfection. It's a study of perfection that renders human being better with every passing day. And therefore here, this particular kind of uh, character the scholar Gypsy represents uh, that man of culture who wishes to refine his soul and who wishes uh, to establish beauty and peace in the society. To use uh, Matthew Arnold's expression here, uh, to uh, filter sweetness and light uh, in the society by becoming the man of culture. By When I say by becoming the man of culture, to be refined in his values to be refined in his thoughts or to be refined in his mannerism and to strive always you know to better yesterday to better the society and to uh, contribute to the significant cause of the society and therefore uh, he says that this lies on the bourgeois you know that uh, john uh, the, you know matthew arnold has uh, you know classified victorian society in three classes in this particular you know critical work called culture anarchy and uh, that class that he talks about that you know is very handy in bringing in uh, the study of perfection of culture is the bourgeois society and therefore this particular guy seems to be the kind of representative of that bourgeoisie here who wishes to refine himself and by refining himself he wants you know to kind of spread this refinement across the society that he lives in and therefore you know we, you know he appears on the screen again on the screen you know screen of, you know scene on the of the poem again and again and he, he in in a, in a way at the same time they miss aloof uh, uh, aloof uh, uh, you know from the society they, that he is part of and therefore uh, he planned to stay with the gypsies until uh, he learned everything he could and then he revealed their secrets to the planet and therefore, uh, he is a man of culture, as I told you. He has got this cosmic vision, vision of the globe, cosmic vision to transcendence. Because he not only wants to kind of, he you know wishes to achieve that transcendence, but he doesn't want to keep it to himself. He wishes to spread that transcendence after he achieves the secret of life from the gypsies to the other, you know, kind of people of Victorian era and the Victorian society. And therefore, he, you know, he, he, his uh, intention is pretty much didactic here. So this uh, departure. Uh, from modern life uh, to achieve to wisdom uh, and transcendence is very, very uh, significant in the context of the poem. And the story continues, uh, you know, uh, in a way that there is a continuous interrupting uh, of, of, of this particular character. And he has been seen at various places every once in a while people would claim to have seen him in Berkshire style. The speaker imagined him as a shady figure expecting a spark from heaven that is somewhat like everyone else on earth. The speaker even claims to have seen the LM Gypsy once, though 200 years have passed since his story first resulted in the halls of Oxford. Right. And therefore, uh, the people, 
uh, in the vicinity uh, are a bit uh, suspicious or doubtful whether he's still alive or what. Because although he appears, you know, uh, every now and then, but, you know, his, whether the, the, that Shadi figure is the same guy that they are talking about or he, is he someone else, they are not quite sure about it. No, no, thou hast not filled the lapse of hours for what he wears out the life of mortal man. Now, uh, see, there are various uh, kind of voices here, like we know that uh, the poetic persona here, you know, uh, in a way addresses, no, no, thou hast not lost the lapse of hours for what wears out the life of mortal man. It's not uh, this that from change to change they are being rules. This that repeated shock socks again and again exhaust the energy of strongest soul. Sorry, exhaust energy of strongest soul and numb of the elastic power till having used our nerves with the bliss and team and tied upon a thousand schemes are beat to the just pausing genius we remit our worn out life and are what we have been. Thou hast not lived, why should thou perish? So thou hast one aim, one business, one desire, else wert thou long since numbered with the deed, else thou hast thou spent like other men they fire. The generation of the, thy peers are fled, and we ourselves shall go, but thou possessed an immortal lot, and we imagine the exempt from age, and living a thou livest on Ganwis page, because thou hast what we alas have not. So here, uh, the poetic persona uh, of the poem uh, praises, uh, praises the gypsy uh, for uh, his you know, difference or his uniqueness that you know, makes him a kind of uh, an individual who is very different from most of the Victorian clan. Because uh, he, you know, he is the one who doesn't wish to spend his life in the midst of, uh, let's say, these materialistic people, and therefore uh, he is of more view of the view that uh, one should live the life, you know, for achieving the enlightenment of the soul. Because materialistic way of life, you know, materialistic way of life, in a way, worn out the souls of the people. And these worn out souls are dissatisfied, dissatisfied individuals. And this dissatisfaction ultimately leads to uh, these strange modern disease, uh, strange modern disease of uh, something called disillusionment and disappointment. And therefore, since the gypsy have not actually been the part of this uh, so-called uh, infected, polluted, materialistic society, he waits for a spark from the heaven. And since, you know, his deeds are addressed in that direction, he will not get worn out like most of the modern being, says the poetic person here. Because as a modern people, as a materialistic being, he refers that most of the modern materialistic being would suffer, suffer as a reaction towards their action. And uh, he being unattached to those uh, materialistic upbringing won't uh, be suffering the same actually kind of uh, situation or facing same kind of situation as these modern being Victorian people are facing. And therefore, this misery of modern life this misery or melancholy of modern life, Victorian life, is pretty much highlighted here. If you could recall uh, the poem, uh, you, know, you can think of another poem that touches upon the same thing. Uh, you could easily recall this very famous poem uh, called Dower Beach by the same poet. You know that Dower Beach is, is a kind of, uh, you know, metonymy for the Victorian age uh, that represents uh, the melancholy situation. The Dower Beach as, as a place in England, you know, it represents as a metonymy and the atmosphere that, uh, that he describes, you know, at the seashore at, at Dower Beach, you know, that um, 
it is full of melancholy and envy and therefore this melancholic uh, nature of human being of victorian human being uh, is is something that that needs to be addressed he thinks of and therefore the intention of the poet here uh, in describing this eerie atmosphere and on we you know a kind of uh, surrounding is to uh, you know kind of bring in the change in the psyche collective psyche of the victorian people who were driven by the cause and the cause was to upgrade the living standard of life but gypsy on the other hand he was more concerned about you know improving the quality of life so this again offers another kind of paradigm of the standard and the quality of life so most of the victorian people or the collective victorian psyche was driven by improving the standard of life but the gypsy of the poem is pretty much different from those collective psyche he, he he in a way kind of offers a you know kind of soothing uh, you know he offers soothing effect you know upon the kind of maladies of victorian people because he is different from them and he is driven by uh, the cause of improving the quality of life and therefore he waits for this heaven saint moment for the spark from the heaven and therefore as he also attempts like uh, when he says that when he achieves uh, this emancipation of soul he will also you know kind of cater to the needs of modern society and therefore uh, this very idea of uh, of waiting for transcendence is very very important because as a person no he hasn't you know uh, hasn't uh, suffered enough and he is so driven by the cause that he has got one aim in his life you know that he is uh, what should i say his uh, motives are one direction he you know fights for he battles although it's an, an inner battle of the gypsy but he he you know his battles are driven towards only one cause and yes we wait till but it still delays and then we suffer amongst us one who most has um, has suffered takes positively his seat upon the intellectual throne and his all store of sad experience he lays bare of race days tell us his misery birth growth and signs and how the dying spark of hope was fed and how the breast was soothed and how the head and all these hourly hourly varied anecdotes right but the gypsy appears like uh, various scenes and this having chosen to repeat his lifestyle the scholar gypsy does suffer from shocks but instead of free from the sick fatigue languid doubt he has escaped the perils of modern life which slowly creeping up and destroying man like a strange disease the speaker finishes the by imploring that the scholar gypsy avoid everyone who suffers from the disease lest he become infected as well and therefore you know that uh, he uh, wishes to remain aloof from uh, these modern people because he also is afraid of that he may to get affected by these strange modern diseases right so although this poem explores one of uh, the signature signature themes uh, of of arnold's poetry the theme of depressing monotony and toil of modern life it is unique in that it works through a narrative there are in fact two levels of storytelling at work in the poem and that of scholar gypsy and that of the speaker who is grappling with uh, ideas poised by that singular figure both levels of story relay the same message the scholar gypsy has transcended life by escaping modern life and as he usually does ordinary here criticizes modern life as wearing down even the strongest of man its choice of word disease is telling is telling since it implies that this style is contagious even those who try uh, to avoid modern life will eventually become infected and that is pretty much true because what what uh, one thinks of and what one performs 
you know, there is a you know, hell of difference between performance and uh, something called practice. And therefore, uh, Arnold was of the view that uh, this strange disease of modern life is so powerful that uh, every human being eventually get affected or infected by this particular contagious disease. And that is true in a sense, because Collar Gypsy, as a person, he couldn't control, you know, his uh, desire, his ambition, although he was, you know, wishes to, you know, achieve something called heaven sent movement, something called transcendence in the context of the poem. But he, you know, was unable to control his desire to be the part of modern life as well. And therefore, whenever he appears on this, you know, on this, on the scene of the poem, you know, that gives us an enough insight into his psyche that although he wishes to achieve the transcendence of the soul, the enlightenment of the soul, but he was unable to control, you know, to be the part of this modern society. And therefore he appears again and again on this, you know, on, on the scene uh, in the poem. He, you know, he, he appears in the winter, in the spring, in the autumn, and that too at various different places. And therefore, his appearance at different places, you know, also, you know, kind of uh, gives us an insight into his mentality, his psyche, to enjoy the modern ways of lifestyle at the same time. Uh, you know, and therefore, this, uh, the parallelism, parallel kind of uh, contradiction, you know, like Matthew Arnold always you know, proposes kind of contradiction in his poems. And this poem offers, you know, this uh, contradiction of two various uh, you know, psyche of the same person. And these two, again, like uh, as a modern being, the Victorian people, you know, were also kind of uh, got affected by, uh, by this disease of modernity. And therefore, this machinery, as he calls it, you know, in this book called Culture and Anarchy, this machinery or machinery development, you know, won't count for much. And therefore, he appeals, you know, most of the in appeals Victorian people uh, in his most of the critical, you know, prose and poetry uh, to mend the folly of his mind, of their minds, by, you know, kind of uh, coveting the spiritual you know, kind of uplifting uh, uh, so as to kind of become the man of culture because for him, you know, culture is a study of perfection and rendering the human being better than the yesterday. This materialistic development or what he calls as machinery, even he mentions religion as a machinery in this beautiful work, you know, called Culture Anarchy. I would say that this particular poem uh, is is a kind of literary supplement, you know, a kind of uh, fictional supplement or a, a poetic supplement to, to this work called uh, Culture, Culture and Anarchy, in which here the man, the gypsy, you know, is a man of culture who wishes uh, to kind of filter down the beauty and the peace, the sweetness and light in the society. In this way, this poem uh, makes a comment on uh, the perils of conformity, as other poems in this collection do. What makes the scholar Gypsy so powerful is not only that he wishes to avoid modern life, many wish to do. More importantly, he is willing to entirely repudiate normal society for the sake of his transcendence. There is slightly uh, Pessimistic worldview implicit in that idea, since it, is, since it is clearly not possible to reveal in true individuality and still be a part of society. The scholar Gypsy has had to turn his back entirely on Oxford, which represents learning and modernity here in order to become this great figure. And yet the poem overall is much more optimistic than many of Arnold's work precisely because it suggests that we can transcend if we are willing to pay that cost. This makes it differently from poem like A Summer's Night, which explores the same theme that laments the cost of separation that individuality requires. For all his admiration, the speaker clearly has not yet mustered the strength to repudiate the world and the setting helps establish his contradictory feelings. The poem begins with the images of peaceful, serene rural life, 
a place where men can act as they always have. They have been untouched by the perils of modernity. Pastoral imagery has always been associated in poetry with type of innocence and purity, unfiltered humanity in touch with nature. The speaker is not out in the field contemplating this type of life, the possibility of acting as the uh, scholar Gypsy did. And yet he is also studying the towers of Oxford, which as I, as I mentioned above, represent the, represent the rapidly changing, strictly structured world that the scholar Gypsy renounced. Arnold deftly expresses the speaker's split priorities through this juxtaposition. At the same time that he admires the scholar Gypsy, he cannot fully turn his back on the modern life. Thus, the poem overall represents Arnold's inner conflict, his desire to live a transcendent life, but inability inability to totally eschew society. At this point in his life, Arnold felt pulled in different directions by the world's world of demand, the quantum of quantum as the modernists say. He was trying to resist the infection of modernism, but it was creeping upon him nevertheless. And the pressure to confirm was negatively affecting his poetry. Undoubt undoubtedly Arnold wished he could escape in the way the scholar Gypsy did. However, he was too tied down by responsibilities to ever dream of doing so. And this is the condition of the most of uh, the modern being. That although we wish to kind of go away uh, you know, from the society in order to improve the quality of life, but we are actually tied, you know, kind of by, tied down by many of so-called social responsibilities, you know, personal responsibilities, emotional responsibilities. Although we wish to, you know, be the part of different plan to achieve transcendence, but as a part of you know, modern materialistic world, it is impossible, you know, for uh, even Arnold, person like Arnold, you know, poet like Arnold, philosopher like Arnold, to totally eschew himself from the society and uh, let alone the common people of the era, how would they escape from this strange modern disease, uh, you know, this strange materialistic way of life. And therefore, creating this you know, figure of the gypsy, you know, the scholar gypsy, we often say that uh, the literature is an alternative gratification, right? You know, in, you know that very famous essay, uh, you know, Sigmund Freud literature and Sigmund Freud's psychoanalysis and literature, you know, like that in that particular essay, you know that how literature works as a kind of alternative gratification. In this way, this creation of, uh, of scholar gypsy, the character of scholar gypsy is a kind of uh, gratification, emotional gratification of uh, the poet himself, because as, as a person of the society, in reality, he isn't unable or wasn't enabled to uh, wasn't unable to be the part of the clan who wants to improve the quality of life to go away from the society and to achieve the enlightenment of the soul to achieve the emancipation you know but he fulfills uh, his uh, you know kind of um, repressed you know desire to the displaced uh, you know means as we call it. and this, this displaced you know uh, vehicle that he uses here is the character of scholar Gypsy, through which he, you know, in a way fulfills his desire to be the part of that clan who, and who you know, works for the improvement of uh, improvement uh, for the call, improving the quality of the life, not the standard of the life. And therefore, this works like an alternative kind of gratification, you know, a way of gratification for the for the poetic uh, persona as well as for the poet himself in the context of the poem and also you know to the every man the readers you know, who are reading uh, this piece of poem beautiful piece of poem you know uh, poetry sorry beautiful piece of poetry who also are unable to untie themselves from their modernistic root materialistic root but they you know could also like uh, the poet himself you know be the part of that clan, although not in reality, but through the pages of literature, through those pages of this particular beautiful piece of poetry, to realize that uh, something untouched, 
you know, untouched way of life, wherein the purpose of life, or the aim of life, the one aim, one goal, as the poet calls, is to wait for the heaven sent moment, is to wait for the spark from the heaven. And this spark from the heaven, uh, achieving this spark from the heaven, you know, seems to be, you know, it, it seems to be the goal or aim of the all modern human being. And so is of the poet himself in the context of the poem, of the listeners and of the speaker here, and of course, of the, everybody who, who actually encounter this problem in modern life, who approaches this poem from that perspective. And therefore, this poem, uh, you know, it has got, you know, this didactic, you know, didactic uh, approach here that, you know, in a way, it also, uh, it, you know, delights, but at the same time, it teaches us more. It, the poem has got message. And the medium that he uses is the so is something called the scholar gypsy, who learns the wisdom of the clan, something called gypsies, the band. So this gypsy represents, you know, uh, you know kind of uh, indigenous human, you know, uh, DNA. I would say uh, those who you know live in jungle in the forest, and you know that mother nature. Uh, is full of bountiful and it offers all the wisdom in the world and the person, the people who stay in the close proximity of the nature, these people are gypsies and they know this, you know, this kind of all the secrets of modern, all the secrets of leading a beautiful life. And therefore the scholar gypsy also was, wants to kind of realize his life in that particular direction and uh, uh, make his life better by achieving the transcendence of the soul, by achieving the enlightenment of the soul, by achieving the emancipation of the soul. So did the readers of all this particular poem. In this, I am I'm done with this poem. Another poem in the line to discuss is uh, The Blessed Damsel by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Right. The Blessed Damsel by Dizzy Rossetti uh, is uh, through and through a pre-Raphaelite poem. And his particular poem captures all the features of the Raphaelite school of poetry. Before I start off with uh, the discussion of the poem, I feel it is important to discuss uh, what is pre Raphaelite school of poetry in brief. And before I even discuss that, I would like to, you know, kind of uh, give a brief uh, intro to the poet uh, himself. So Dizzy Rossetti, as a poet, had a you know has a keen liking you know special liking for painting, uh, but he was also interested in poetry. In the year 1850, he met Elizabeth uh, Siddal. She la later became uh, Rossetti's model and eventually his wife. But her death pushed uh, Rossetti, already depressed, into deeper melancholy. Rossetti placed manuscripts of his poem in his wife's grave. However, marked by tragedy, his reputation grew rapidly. In 1869, he decided to publish a volume of his poems. In the same period, he suffered from headache, weakened eyesight and in, in, insomnia, and he took plural that accentuated depression and paranoia. In 1872, he suffered mental breakdown, hallucination, and accusing devices. He was taken to Scotland but he got recovered, but unfortunately he died of kidney failure on April 1882. This pre-Raphaelite brother, brotherhood, as the name suggests itself, were inspired by Italian painter Raphael, who is, uh, who is very, very famous for his uh, oil painting and the minute details in his painting how Raphael, an Italian painter, you know, kind of sketched down his paintings. 
in a very beautiful way they would seem like a photographic you know kind of painting if you look at the paintings of this pre raphaelite you will get an impression like it's it's like a photograph you know of 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 some some human that is snapped by a camera they were so minute minute in details they were so driven to the cause that they would in a way kind of uh, paint a picture uh, on the models of uh, this italian painter called raphael and they brought this trend of kind of uh, presenting pictorial vision in the poetry as well and therefore this all pre raphaelite you know poet you know this pre raphaelite brotherhood which was found in the year 1848 you know was uh, the group of uh, you know uh, painters and poets this pre raphaelite poets were through and through artist and art was their religion they treated art as their religion and their whole aim their ultimate aim uh, was to use pain a pain as a paint brush so as to kind of create a mental picture through the words right and therefore the use of pain as a paint brush is sketched literally sketched you know the beautiful you know kind of uh, uh, painting through uh, the proper you know kind of grouping of the words the poets you know who in you know, all these poets you know like pictorality was one of the significant features of their poetry along with the pictorality you know they also were the poet who actually believed in this uh, particular trend called art for art sake because unlike most of the victorian poets you know who were concerned with the melancholy uh, with uh, kind of uh, loss of the values you know thing in the victorian era this group was a kind of uh, group with a difference i would say who uh, were more concerned about the art they were not at all concerned about uh, kind of art for life sake kind of thing they were more concerned about the art and they treated art as a religion and they focused on their literary work of art uh, as approached work of art as art and they think that literary work of art has no other purpose to serve but to you know treat art as an art nothing else nothing more so such people such a kind of artist they include the names like dante gabriel rossetti john milias william hunt james collinson you know who was a painter then sculptor thomas wulner painter and critic frederick george stephen and critic william michael rossetti and of course uh, you know kind of the sister called christina rossetti this pre raphaelite brotherhood sought to introduce new forms of thematic and moral uh, seriousness right like uh, this uh, you know kind of uh, thematical introduction if you could look at Uh, their poetry would see that uh, they return to the medieval uh, kind of uh, theme in their poetry, and they also refer uh, you know kind of moral moral seriousness in the work art, their work of art. And you could see that uh, in their poetry, you know, there is high colorization, as you could see there in this particular picture here of this lady. How photographic it is! How beautifully you know painted oil painting on the canvas. and there is also sincerity you know uh, in their work of art this poem uh, the blessed damsel uh, is a dramatic lyric poem of 144 lines in 24 line stanzas you know and the first version of uh, this completed poem was published in the year 1847 and was published uh, in this particular uh, mouthpiece of the pre raphaelite school of poetry called the germ rosetti revises revisited revised and republished the poem in 1856 this particular poem uh, Ros- uh, for this particular poem rosetti rosetti conceived the idea uh, from edgar allan poe's poem the raven about a man who mourns the death of his beloved dinner and after reviving dante's divine comedy in which arthur's first love betrays escorts him from purgatory to heaven during his imaginary journey through the realms of the afterlife so this particular you know poem is in, uh, you know is inspired basically by uh, pose the raven and dante's divine comedia 
So the theme of the poem is undying love. The death of the damsel separated her from the man she loves. The love man she loves, and but after her his death, she goes to the heaven and she waits for him to join her up there in the sky. So does the hope that one day, with the hope that one day uh, they will reunite, reunite in the heaven. Now this particular picture, you know, that becomes, you know, poem. The first four stanza of the poem are described in this particular picture, right? As you could see that uh, the damsel, you know, uh, blessed damsel, but with her appearance, it seems that she is more of damsel in distress. You know, as the poem says that, you know, the poem starts that she had three lilies in her hand and in her hair, the stars were seven kind of things. You could easily see there are three lilies in her hand and how these uh, kind of, uh, uh, how the lower down, you know, on the earth waiting for, you know, thinking about, waiting for and thinking about the beloved who has now departed for heavenly abode. The poem starts uh, uh, with the poem starts abruptly, and uh, this abrupt uh, you know beginning of the poem without any sort of introduction here uh, is is very significant and also very much spectral in its nature. The poem will you know this first line, stanza of the poem will give you kind of pictorial quality of uh, this particular group of the poet called uh, the Pre-Raphaelite. The poem begins in this way. The blessed damsel leaned out from the golden bar of heaven. Her eyes were deeper than the depth of water. Still at heaven, she had three lilies in her hand and the stars in her were seven. When we utter these words, you know, like the blessed damsel leaned out from the golden bar of heaven, it creates a kind of mental picture in the minds of a reader. As I already mentioned here that one of the features of uh, the Pre-Raphaelite School of Poetry is pictorial quality of their poem, right? And therefore, this the moment we utter the words like the blessed damsel lean out from the golden bar of heaven, you could actually you know, uh, see that the mental picture is being created in the minds of reader. Her eyes were deeper than the depth of water still at heaven. She had three lilies in her hand and the stars in her were seven. Heaven is, is picture, pictured, as a, pictured as a castle high above and beyond the world. Now this heaven, as we know, is uh, something which is uh, beyond the human capacity. It's a metaphysical concept as we all know. And as the heaven is, uh, heaven is heaven, you know, where everything is well, you know, where all is, it's a utopian, uh, you know, situation where all is well where the beloved actually waits for her lover to join and she leans down from the heaven and she stares at her lover. And this golden bar is such an imagery describing the golden barrier which surrounds heaven or such a frame-like imagery. The third and fourth line describe the quiet depth of her eyes and stillness of water in the evening that her eyes are even deeper than the water. Just imagine, uh, you know, for... Uh, for a person, you know, who has just, you know, you know kind of traveled, her soul traveled for him abroad. And her unrequited love, the love that she had or has for her, her lover is unfulfilled. And therefore, when she goes up there in the heaven, she uh, looks at, uh, looks down uh, on the, uh, down there uh, at the earth, you know, stares down at the earth, and her eyes look steeper than the water. Three lilies allude to the Trinity and seven stars are found in Revelation. This has got really religious connotation here. Three lilies, you know, and uh, the seven stars are found in Revelation of the Bible, you know. Seven stars are the angels of seven churches whereas they are heavenly beings. Seven stars are also symbolized, are also symbolized the Pileads, the seven doctors of Atlas and Cleon in Greek mythology. They attended the gardeners of virginity, Hermetis, after, you know, died. Her rob and cut from the class to him, no rod flowers did adorn, but a white rose of Mary's gift for service meekly worn. 
her hair that lay long back was yellow like ripe corn. See again the description here, the pictorial quality of words here, you know, the imagery, use of imagery here is very, very significant. The word like rob, you know, flowers are very, very, you know, or, or let's say yellow ripe corn. They, in a way, give us, you know, kind of insight into the psyche of, uh, into the psyche of the poet that he wishes to create the picture. And as I told you that one of the features of Victor, of, of this uh, prayer reference school of poetry was uh, to use pain as a paintbrush. And uh, DJ Rosetti here has put that uh, particular, you know, thing to the effect that he creates a sort of a mental picture, you know, uh, through this beautiful arrangement of words here in this particular stanza as well. And therefore, this stanza refers to the visual image of her appearance in heaven. No embroidered frost adorn the rock, but a white rose which is gift from Virgin Mary in recognition of the damsel's faithful service to heaven. Now, this use of white, you know, rose here is very significant. White stands for chastity, white chance stands for purity, right? And this uh, purity, again, uh, this uh, again is very, very significant because this poem can be read as uh, a religious poem in its entirety because the poem has got so many religious connotation here, you know, uh, to begin with uh, the three lilies and seven stars and then here, those virgins, uh, seven you know, sisters, as mentioned in Revelation of the Bible. And again, this uh, use of the white rose is very significant. You know, white rose stands for chastity, stands for purity. And she gets it, it as, a, as a gift from Virgin Mary in recognition of her faithful service to heaven. Her hair is another symbol that links heaven and earth almost as if it would have drawn the man heaven word and therefore her hair like it, it's like a rope you know that actually you know pulls up uh, the man down at down on the earth uh, towards upward in the heaven it seemed she scarce had a been had been a day one of god's chorister the wonder was not yet quite gone from that still look of hers albeit to them she lived her day had counted as 10 years it seems that uh, she has uh, abided in the celestial realm no more than a day. It seems that she has been there up there in the sky, in the heaven for a day only, but for her every moment, you know, of you know, separation from, uh, from her lover is like 10 years of years. It's, it, although it is an ex exaggeration you know, of the situation, it is a use of hyperbole. Through this use of hyperbole, writer, the poet here wants to convey the intensity of the beloved. Now, how intense, how passionate her love is her counterpart. And therefore, although she has been there up in the heaven for a day, but for her, you know, the one day has been like 10 years of years, you know, like many, many years. And if it feels like many years have been have been passed in the process, uh, in the process, in the process uh, of uh, this poem, but it is just has been a day, uh, says the poet. She is not aware of how long it has been. She just keep on serving in the heaven as if she has not even completed one day. But although you know she is not aware about her presence, existence in the heaven. In order to serve the you know kind of heavenly thing, heaven, the gods and goddesses, she is pretty much driven. But when it comes to thinking about her counterpart, you know, it's very difficult for her because it's very difficult to pass the time from your beloved one. She loves him a lot, you know. She he, he is uh, the one, you know, who is her life, and therefore it's very difficult you know, for her to live the life of separation, even for a day. But the ones she has left behind miss her so much that it is as if 10 years have been passed since they lost saw her, but that is not the case. And then in the space, you know, to one, it is 10 years of years, yet now in this place, surely she leaned over me, her hair fell all about my face, nothing taught them fall of leaves, the whole year sits place. Now here in the, uh, bracket in parenthesis you could see this is the voice of a lover 
this poem is very very significant for its narrative technique although you know like uh, we hardly see such a novel way of presenting uh, you know the poetic voices in the poem the poem has uh, two or three different voices here in the context of the poem one the voice of a lover say one the voice of a beloved second the voice of a of a lover and the third the voice of the poet or the poetic persona here so in the context of the narrative kind of strategy narrative kind of genius here novelness the poem stands out you know in, in you know in literature because hardly would uh, you know kind of uh, come across such a poem uh, which uh, develop uh, you know kind of this parallel uh, narratives of uh, the kind of significant characters in the poem in a, in a typical kind of dramatic manner it's a very much dramatical representation uh, by the poet here and this narrative novelness uh, in the poor's form is 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 something novel and something that is not to be found in literature it is hardly found in literature i would rather say and therefore this particular you know kind of use of even parenthesis you know kind of bracket is something which is which, uh, which appeals us as a reader a kind of stylistic analysis you know is on actually you know on for such a piece of art and therefore uh, this use of bracket here is very significant as if it's like a comment of 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 uh, some critic in the bracket it is a kind of a comment here he visualizes like uh, what she must be doing there he says that for her it is you know a ten year a moment is like year but for him ten year is like years of year he feels yet now in this place in this place he refers to the earth surely she leaned over me she thinks of you know that she must be leaning over him her hair fell all about my face she you know kind of imagines she fantasizes you know it's a, this poem also offers a kind of a dream vision this poem as a dream vision for it this poem poems also offers kind of dream analysis uh, of of these particular characters that we have for the study and then surely she laid over me her hair fell up all about my face nothing the autumn fall of leaves the whole year sits a pace but alas you know he thinks of you know as she is leaning down up from the sky and all her hair you know uh, are falling on his face but alas he waits there is a pause you know in the form of these uh, dots you know there is a pause and it's you know there is a revelation sudden revelation and he says nothing the autumn fall of leaves the whole year sits a pace he says and uh, you know he realizes he awakes from the dream it seems and he realizes that these are not hair of his beloved rather these are the autumn leaves you know autumn leaves that is falling on on his face these lines are a combination of fantasy sensuality and longing in the midst of decay along emphasize on hair and the adorned lady of the poem for her lover it is as if she has been gone 10 years of fear while the young man thinks he feels her hair fall over him he discovers only the fall of autumn leaves there is a uh, hair supports the romantic image of the pre-raphaelite school of poetry it was rampart of god's house that she was standing on by god built over the sheer depth the which its space begin so high that looking downward then she scarce could see the sun so here uh, this place which is built high up in the sky the house of god as you know heaven is there up in the sky and this is built by god you know which is far 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 above and from there you know it's very difficult to look downward the very you know feeling or the very moment uh, the beloved looks downward you know she could hardly see the sun from there right so this stanza depicts the distance between uh, earth and heaven it also fathoms the pain of the separated young lovers and emphasizes the vastness of the gulf separating them and therefore this gulf of separation between uh, the love of you know subject matter the lovers lover or let's say lover and beloved here is huge this gulf cannot be you know can there uh, cannot be you know breached they cannot uh, it's very uh, difficult for uh, these people uh, to kind of uh, reunite again 
it's, it is going to be tough task for them, it seems, to reunite because there is you know, a hell of difference between heaven and so-called the earth. The distance between them is so enormous that she can hardly see uh, the sun and she's not even able to see the earth from that height. It is so high up there in the galaxy that she could hardly see the sun and even uh, the earth is not visible from uh, that particular place. It lies in heaven across the flood of either as breach, beneath the tides of the day and night, flame and darkness reach the void as low as where this earth spins like a fateful niche. It's, it's, uh, the heaven is up there in the high. It lies in the heaven across the flood of either as bridge. Well, she's trying to watch for the earth down below her on the other side of the sky that stands as a bridge between the earth and the heaven. Floods, the tides of day and night occur. That is to say, uh, that is to say, daytime comes and passes and gives its place to night, which soon becomes a day. So it, uh, in a way, kind of, uh, again, uses an, a different analogy. Uh, to exemplify the situation that they have. Like this particular object that the sky and the earth, the sky and earth never meet. And it's, it's impossible, you know, that these two objects, these two stars, these two, you know, kind of entity meet. The sky and the earth, they are separated forever. It's impossible for these two objects to meet. So this analogy is used for uh, also kind of uh, exemplifying the situation of uh, these people, lover and beloved, how impossible, how difficult for them is to meet. It is like, you know, the way the day and night cannot meet, it, in the, the sky and the earth cannot meet. In the same manner, you know, it would be impossible for the lover and the, for the beloved to meet and to unite, you know, in the heaven. It seems. And in its huge space, the world is spinning like a nervous insect. And uh, it seems that earth, the earth is very low down. And from there, from the sky, from the heaven, it seems it looks like a tiny insect, a tiny insect. The earth appears a fretful, a tiny speck, insect to uh, the beloved from there, around her lover, newly met, mid deathless death's acclaim, spoke ever more among themselves, their heart remembered names, and the souls mounting up to God, went by her like thin flames. The poet here, uh, or the poetic persona, and now he, this is the voice of uh, the poetic persona. I told you that this poem is very unique for its, uh, you know, verse narrative. There are three different voices in the poem. So far, we have discussed about two voices, the voice of a beloved and the voice of a lover. Now here, this is the voice of the poetic person. Around her, her, her lovers newly made, made deathless loves acclaim, spoke ever more among themselves, their heart remembered names, and the souls mounting up to God went by her like thin flames. She observes that spirit of dead fleshes seem to go up and down in heaven like lights. And to emphasize the loneliness of separated lovers, the poet presents an image of happiness of lovers when they are united in them. Here, you know, there is a picture of uh, those uh, reunion of the souls up there in the sky. She could literally see the flames, you know, coming up from the sky, from the earth, and they are reuniting there with another soul in the sky. And this, you know, uh, in a way ignites her uh, enthusiasm ignites, you know, kind of optimism in her heart that as other souls are mounting up to God and they are, you know, kind of finding their significant other, their counterpart in the process up in the heaven. She also in a way kind of becomes hopeful, optimistic here that she too will be reunited, you know, like other souls. And for that, she serves the Almighty, she serves the God in a very, very proper manner. And therefore, she is pretty much confident. You know, it seems that she is confident that one day, you know, she is going to meet uh, her, her lover for sure. But, and still she bowed herself and stooped out of her charm until her bosom must have made the bar she leaned out warm and the lilies as lay as if asleep along her bended arm. The speaker describes her the charming beauty while she is stepping out, eager to reach down heaven from uh, heaven to her lover. She still continues to look down in the vastness of the space, yearning for her 
heart bound in mind. But alas, she looks down. She could observe other souls waiting up in the heaven, but she still found on of that reunion as she thinks of. Right, and therefore her physical profile, you know, is described like one of the features of uh, kind of uh, Rehafet School of Poetry is uh, this uh, physical description, you know, the physicality or sexualness or sensuousness of the poetry, you know, is pretty much there in the Rehafet School of Poetry. This poem also offers enough, you know, kind of glimpse into that particular feature of poetry. Uh, and because of this uh, so-called uh, fleshly nature or this uh, sensuality or sexuality, description of sexuality or physical beauty in the poem, you could see that you know, there are a couple of stanzas that are devoted for describing the physical beauty of uh, this damsel in the poem. Right. And therefore, this uh, overt, open description of sexual things, sexualness, even, uh, you know, in, there are stanzas in the poem that in a way suggests enough regarding uh, the kind of uh, uh, their sexual reunion too, not only kind of, you know, kind of union of the soul, but also kind of sexual reunion too in the stanzas uh, described in the poem. And therefore, uh, for as this, you know, poets were uh, also driven to the cause to describe the sensualness, sexualness, or kind of physical profile of the person of, of the beauty in the poem. The critic like Robert Buchanan often criticized this kind of poetry as fleshly school of poetry. Robert Buchanan, who was a very famous critic, Victorian critic, and uh, he criticized uh, this school of poetry as fleshly school of poetry for its over sexual description in the poetry. And this uh, stanza gives us a glimpse uh, of that particular thing. From the fixed place of heaven, she saw time like a pulse shake fears through all the worlds. Her gaze still strove within the gulf to pierce its path. And now she spoke as when the stars sang in the spheres. In the first two lines, the contrast between the steadiness of heaven, the fixed place and the fierce pulsing of time, time like a pulse sh uh, shake fears is shown. She's trying to pierce the huge gulf with her gaze just to see the world beneath her. She stares continuously, and through her continuous stare, it seems that she will pierce the gulf, you know, the gulf between these two places, as we have talked about. She starts to speak towards the Earth's way on the sky. The speaker makes resemblance between shining stars and his lover that the stars are shining as if they're singing in the sky. So his lover speaks just like shining stars. So here there is an, a kind of resemblance between shining stars as the stars are shining the star in the sky. In the same manner, uh, she thinks that uh, her lover too, you know, uh, the writer poet thinks that her lover too must be speaking like a shining stars. The sun was gone now, the curled moon was like a little feather fluttering far down the gulf and now she spoke through the still weather. Her voice was like the voice the star had when they sang together. It becomes night now, and the new moon appears in the sky like a little feather that bl blinks steadily. Far down the gulf implies that even the moon stays nearer to the world because it also far away from heaven, which is mainly times are on the layers of the sky. The weather is so calm and still that it uh, feels as if her voice can be heard nearly, and it is also strong like the lights of all stars when they shine all together. So in this way, she presents, ah, sweet even now in that bird song, stow not her accents there, faint to be hearkened when those bells possessed the midday air, stow not her steps to reach my side down on the echoing stair. Again, in these lines, the speaker tells us their hopelessness. Even the night was still, she could not make her voice noticed. Bird songs shows that it is morning now and she better stop trying and struggling to announce. The speaker seems to sorry to hear e bells that notify it is midday. It is better for the lady not to, it is better for the lady uh, not to strive to reach their lover, believing that it is useless because her voice just echoes among the layers of the sky, it does not even reach the world. I wish that he were come to me, for he will come, she said, 
have I not prayed in in heaven on earth? Lord, Lord, has He not prayed? Are not two prayers a perfect strength? And shall I feel afraid? She is pretty much optimistic here that you know she thinks that she will be reunited with her counterpart in the heaven because she thinks that both of them have prayed enough because she knows the power of prayer. It seems, and since both of them have prayed, prayed enough. and they formed equal strength you know why should she should be afraid she feels that because she cannot reach her lover she wants him to reach her okay she says that she has prayed for their union but she stops for a while and worries that her lover has not prayed yet she asks god and wants to learn if it is not true that two lovers prayer is perfect strength if it is so she feels afraid that there must be something wrong with her lover that she he may have forgotten her or nor uh, or nor love her anymore these lines are also linked to matthew again i say unto you that if I, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask it shall be done for them of my father which is in heaven now these lines are taken from this you know matthew the verse in bible and uh, they you know in a way kind of echo this lines echo the lines from this matthew and therefore uh, represent the same kind of uh, attitude here so it refers to the prayer uh, power of prayer when one prays one gets strength and there is an assurance you know there is an assurance it seems that you will be they will be reunited for sure as the almighty the god say you know jesus says in in the same text from matthew that those are served to stand and wait those are served to stand and wait here the 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 poetic persona you know and of course uh, the both the kind of uh, object of study in the poem the damsel and of course the man the young man here they are waiting to be served here they wait they wait and they wait if you go by this dictum those are served to stand and wait it seems you know these two lovers will be you know served one day you know it seems i don't know what happens with them we'll see so in this way like uh, uh, i have kind of clip the side from this slides from this particular side uh, as uh, she promises i uh, she thinks that you know they have prayed enough and why would they meet she you know then imagines uh, her condition that when he joins he joins her up there in the sky what would she do she say that she would actually take her hand and she would go uh to uh the place you know which is uh, kind of quite marooned from the world up there in the heaven and then she will teach him the ways of life then she will uh, take her to the mother you know god and mother mary and will introduce uh, introduce him to them and will proudly you know tell them that she he is my soulmate but then there is a realization Uh, by by the beloved oh alas she says it's just a dream it's just a dream she says and and she down there you know down at uh, on the earth below the lover could see that beloved you know is crying a lot because she realizes that you know that was that that was just was a dream and that there is a sudden actually realization by by uh, the beloved here in the context of the poem and uh, her heart cries aloud and the poor the poem finishes on the note that the lover could hear her tears so this uh, use of figure of speech the lovers could hear uh, her her tears is very very significant and that is where the poem ends so in this way this poem you know is in presented in dream vision and there are three different voices in the poem the poet is pretty much descriptive in nature it captures all the kind of essential features of pre raphaelite school of poetry it uh, uh, presents uh, uh, this uh, uh, kind of unrequited uh, love of the damsel the blessed damsel as the poet calls but it seems that she is not a blessed damsel she is more of a damsel in distress who 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 pines uh, to be reunited uh, with her lover up in the sky but that is she imagines she dreams of the possibilities how she would reimagine but ultimately she realizes that what she is thinking of what she thinks of here all, all here in the poem she realizes suddenly there is realization 
she is being thrown into the reality and she the reality is, is that she faces is very grim that she thinks that what what she has dreamed of that is just a kind of an illusion and uh, it's impossible for it, it seems that uh, to be reunited with her lover in the context of the poem and therefore she cries and that cry of the hurt is being heard by the lover down on the earth so with this uh, i i am done with uh, my explanation on the poem with this kapil sir i i stop thank you so much for uh, giving me an opportunity to present uh, uh, my lecture on, yeah. on these two points described for the paper called romantic and the poetry of atim thank you so much uh, sir for the opportunity okay thank you govind so sir has dealt with both the poems prescribed in the last unit of uh, paper from romantic to victorian age uh, romantic and victorian poetry and uh, on behalf of the organizers i appreciate effort of Do of uh, mr govind rathore for being here on sunday as well to make up for the uh, class that we had missed at its scheduled time so thanks Th thank you govind on behalf of the organizers and tomorrow we'll be meeting again in the morning at 10 o'clock for the next session so i declare the session is over